My name is Pete McBride, and I am a photographer filmmaker, and I'm here to support Kevin Fedarko, the author. Uh, my name's Kevin Fedarko. Uh, I'm an author based in Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, and I'm largely the uh, tin can tied to the back of the Pete McBride bumper. The Emerald Mile is the story of a little wooden dory, small boat, and the three river guides who uh, decided to harness a giant historic flood that took place in the Grand Canyon in the summer of 1983 and kind of used that flood as a as a hydraulic slingshot to propel them through the canyon and set the record for what was at the time the fastest boat ride in history through the Grand Canyon. And what led me to that story was that um, prior to writing the book, I had spent six seasons as a river guide uh, in Grand Canyon National Park. Um, and one of the things you do as a river guide when you're not making your way downstream during the day uh, is that you sit around at night around the campfire if it's early spring or late fall and on the decks of your boats if it's in the middle of the summer and you listen to the river guides tell stories and so the longer I spent down there the more I realized that so many of these stories that I was listening to and hearing each and every night that not all of them but a huge number of them kind of revolved around and ultimately connected back to one story which was this epic year this epic runoff and the events that befell the tiny community of uh, river people who have devoted their lives to moving through the bottom of the Grand Canyon. What's interesting and partly why we ended up collaborating again on this Grand Canyon project is that after we'd done years, we'd done a decade of assignments abroad with some, some a lot of misadventures, I went to do my own project and Kevin went to do his own writing this book and I didn't know about it and I went to do one ironically on the Colorado River. So I became very interested in the I followed the Colorado River source to sea and did a lot of documentation with aerial imagery and then uh, focused a lot on the Delta, which I grew up in the state of Colorado and I didn't, I didn't know, like many, that the Colorado River runs dry. It doesn't reach the ocean anymore. And I was amazed by that, so I became very interested in the, the diversion of water and how we've turned this river into a plumbing system. And there's no better icon of that than the top of the Grand Canyon, which is Glen Canyon Dam, which Kevin did an amazingly eloquent job of diving into that subject matter. So we were doing, on some level, parallel stories independently without knowing it. Well, I knew that Kevin had written about this, this amazing speed run. And the one thing I also knew is that, um, and Kevin can talk more about it, but the guy who wrote it was also the first person to walk the entire length of the Grand Canyon. So I went on a mountain bike with Kevin in Flagstaff a few years ago and proposed this crazy idea I had of maybe retracing some of his footsteps. Many people don't know this, but you know, Grand Canyon National Park, which is the second most popular park in the entire system, um, it doesn't have a single trail that will enable you to walk all the way from one end to the other. It's a, it's a river corridor that's 277 miles long, but there are so many tributary canyons and so many breaks in the main canyon corridor that by the time you've winded your way into and out of each one of those, you've walked over 800 miles. To put that in perspective, more people had stood on the surface of the moon than had walked the length of the Grand Canyon in one push. And to think there's some 5,000 people that have stood on the top of Everest and the Grand Canyon's in our backyard, it's, it's kind of amazing just concept at some level. So I thought that this was an apocalyptically bad idea, but also one that was so alluring um, that it would be impossible for me to say no to. So what set this project apart was, first of all, the physical challenges, the, the time commitment. Uh, this would be something that would take over a year for us to complete. But I think the other enormously important element which added to the complexity and the challenge was that you know, Pete was not simply shooting still images for National Geographic, he was incorporating film. Well, it was logistically hard, it was physically hard, but it was hard for us to get comfortable. I was constantly stuffing a camera in Kevin's face and have him talk to me. And we're friends, and there's, uh, initially he could, he's a very poetic, remarkable ability to speak, and I had to like tell him that I, I couldn't use nine minute sound bites. Personally, in my opinion, I think it's the most effective if we share a story with you 
without telling you what to think. We just try to connect to your emotions and give you an experience, take you on a huge adventure and teach you some things along the way and leave you to make up your own mind. Uh, we're not forcing anything on you, we're just trying to remind you of what, what magical landscapes we have out here in the southwest in Grand Canyon. And I love books that make me think outside of my box. But I, I was also, I'm a big fan of Latin America, so sort of an old classic. There's many I, I like, but Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude is the poetry in, of the, in, in how people live and the blend of reality and non-reality magic. Probably the most influential book that I've ever read, the book that shaped and in some ways um, reconfigured my own sensibilities and enabled me to see the world in a different light um, is a book that was published many years ago by a writer named Barry Lopez. It's called Arctic Dreams. It um, very appropriately won the National Book Award the year that it came out. And I remember reading that book as a young man um, in my late 20s. Um, a young man who, you know, grown up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, was working in New York City, knew very little about the wild spaces of the world. And what what Barry Lopez did in that book was he took a landscape which is which is marginalized and dismissed, the Arctic, um, and he just threw this door open in a way that in a way that um, took me by the hand and, and ushered me through it. He also, I think, introduced me to an idea that it was really alien to me at the time, which is that a landscape that many people dismiss as ugly is filled with beauty. And that to really appreciate that beauty and allow yourself to be touched by it, you need to commit to it. You need to spend time reading about it, you need to spend time thinking about it, and ultimately you need to spend time in it. The books that have the greatest influence on our lives, I think we find ourselves returning back to them. Um, they're, not, they're not things that we read once and then move on from and never, um, and never reread again. And, and so it's a testament to, to what he did and what he achieved in that book that I find it as much of a revelation today, 30 years after having read it for the first time as I did back then.